Well, Peter, the first time uh, we had a longer conversation was crossing the Atlantic. You yes. were visiting the United States and uh, had decided to go to Bergen for the weekend. <laughs> so uh, this shows that you are a man of traveling who is uh, touring the world frequently. And uh, this, I guess, is a good thing for a geographer. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about how it all started? How did you become a geographer in the first place? Well, that's a fairly complex story. Uh, uh, I suppose the, uh, the very beginnings of my geographical uh, viewpoint began with an early love of landscape. Uh, um, I, my grandfather on my mother's side was a farmer and my other grandfather was a horticultural scientist and they both taught me a tremendous amount about the land and about landscape. Where was that? Uh, this is in southern England, in Kent. And, uh, and then at school I had the misfortune to do equally well in every subject I took. And in the final stages of my school career, uh, I had in fact uh, got distinctions in a battery of science subjects and also in a number of social science subjects and I didn't really know which direction I wanted to go in. And in fact, my ambition then was to be a writer, to be a novelist uh, or a poet. I thought that creative writing was far more valuable than uh, academic work, which I always regarded as largely derivative and secondary. Uh, but it was my geography teacher, who was a, an excellent teacher, a very stimulating man, who somehow built on my love of landscape who, who was that, do you remember? Oh, he's a man who you wouldn't have heard of, Dr. J.L. Oliver, at uh, a school in Kent, although he subsequently became in charge of geography in a teacher's training college mm -hmm. in Britain. But he had a tremendous feel for landscape, and also uh, I was uh, also very fond of music, and he taught me how I could appreciate landscape through music of different countries and so on. He, he really sort of got to me. So could, could you tell me what... Uh Music did you enjoy at that time? Oh, at that time there were lots of people like um, Smetner and uh, uh, the uh, Finnish man, what's... Uh, Sibelius. Uh, Sibelius, of course, and then, uh, I mean, I also loved Beethoven and Brahms and Mozart, but they weren't the ones who were connected with landscape. Oh. Uh, but I also uh, uh, had a, a fascination for a whole lot of folk songs that this geography master had on records, uh, North American, Spanish, uh, uh, all parts of the world, even African songs. Uh, and at that time I was also very much interested in Africa. I, I still have a first edition of Livingston's uh, Missionary Travels and Researches in Southern Africa, which I bought at that stage and read avidly and read the accounts of other African explorers. So I, in fact, uh, gradually moved towards geography. But I had reservations about it as uh, something to specialize in. And my father, being a businessman, uh, persuaded me that I'd be well advised to do a double major in economics and geography. And at that stage, I wanted to go to Cambridge, which I thought had the, the best school of geography in terms of my interest of landscape and regional geography mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, but I applied for scholarships to Cambridge and also to the London School of Economics. And I was very lucky, really, to get a scholarship to LSE, although it was my second choice, and failed to get one to Cambridge. Uh, because at uh, LSE, London School of Economics, I majored in economics and geography and read some social anthropology and political science, and I became very much a social scientist. I didn't really think of myself as a geographer. Uh, uh, who, uh, when was it? Uh, oh, this was in the late 30s and early 40s. Yeah. Uh, and uh, who were the main uh, Oh, well, Dudley teacher, Stamp teacher, uh, was Dudley then a reader, Stamp, and Rodwell Jones was the head of the geography department, and uh -huh. we had Hilda Ormsby and Gordon East and uh, Stanley Beaver and all those people yeah. were in the geography department. And but uh, just for a second. I think there is a background sound. <laughs> Air conditioning, yeah. 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 Uh, sorry. Yeah. Well, tell me. Please go on from where you 
Yeah. Uh, well, uh, and your uh, teachers in economics? Oh, well, I suppose the, uh, uh, the most important one was uh, Lionel Robbins, uh, but we also had people like Hike, who became leader of a very prominent school, of course, in Chicago. And, uh, but there are other people like Tawney in economic history who stimulated mm -hmm. me greatly, and Lasky in political science. Mm -hmm. And there was Beveridge and Dalton in the economics. There was a very fine team of brilliant people. Mm -hmm. And accordingly, I had a very broad interest in the social sciences, but still had this great love of landscape. And uh, I was also fortunate that when war broke out, we were evacuated to Cambridge University. So I had the best of both worlds. So you uh, could uh, study at Cambridge? I studied in uh, Cambridge, but I also had London lecturers yes. and so on. So I had the best of both departments. Oh, yeah. yes. And I thought they were the best two in Britain at that stage. Was uh, uh, um, uh, Cliff Darby was not yet at Cambridge? No, no, he was not there. In fact, now that you ask me, I find it very difficult to remember who were the Cambridge people. There was Debenham, of course, and Mitchell and various other people, but uh, they didn't have the impact on me that the LSE people did. Mm -hmm. I think the LSE were a good deal more rigorous, but I was still faced with this dilemma at the end of my, grad uh, my course that uh, geography was, my, was something I loved, but it lacked discipline. And I enjoyed the discipline of economics and other social sciences, uh, but uh, didn't really like the content so much. But meanwhile, I joined the Cambridge University Air Squadron and trained partly as a pilot, and I went into the Royal Air Force as a pilot. And for the next four and a half years, I had a wonderful time because uh, uh, it was a very nice war for me because I was uh, sent out to South Africa as a flying instructor on twin-engine aircraft. And uh, I was stationed in about six different places in Southern Africa, flying all day, reading by night, and. Uh, I think in the course of those four years I bought over f a thousand books and read them. I had masses of time for reading. I did field work for a thesis in Swaziland. And, uh, and then I was posted to the Middle East and became a pilot all over the Middle East. So my love of landscape took on a new dimension. And uh, I went back to Britain after the war. My first job was at Bristol University in economics. I was an assistant in the Department of Economics, and I specialized then in agricultural economics. Uh, but I found the discipline satisfying, but the content rather tedious. And mm -hmm. It lacked the vision and the perspective and the breadth and uh, interrelationships that I was interested in. And so eventually I went back to Cape Town University in South Africa, where I had many friends during the war years. And uh, I lectured there for five years as a geographer. Was that uh, during uh, Dr. Talbot's time? Uh, yes, Talbot was Talbot. Uh, head of the department. Uh, yeah. I, I think also to go back to your earlier question, I think there are other strands also as to why I became a geographer. One of them was that my father had been a great traveler in his youth. And he traveled all over the Americas and so uh, much of Europe too. It's in your blood now. And uh, he gave me this great desire to travel. Uh, so I felt I knew Canada and the United States particularly well, even though I'd never been there, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> partly because of the influence of my father. And the war, of course, got me out of Britain and made me uh, see a completely new landscape, and the very one that I had always had a great fascination for. So I think there was a whole series of factors that conspired to make me a geographer. I tried not to be, but I had to be. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, it would have been um, close at hand for you to work with uh, photography, remote sensing in its early days. Have you ever been interested? In I was vaguely interested in it, but uh, it didn't satisfy me. I mean, there was George Dury and others working that yes. field. He'd been a photo uh, interpreter, and so had David Linton, of course, at yes. Sheffield. Yes. Uh, but it seemed, while it might be useful for a geomorphologist, it was totally unsatisfactory for a social geography and the broadest sense of social geography. I mean, I'm basically an economic geographer. And uh, you're dealing, therefore, with processes of which you only see uh, extremely partial evidence mm -hmm. in the landscape. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it never occurred to me to be a useful means of, uh, of launching myself into geography. I suppose partly because my early work, the first research I did was in Swaziland on the um, uh, land use patterns of the Swazis, where I worked with Hilda Cooper, a 
brilliant anthropologist in Johannesburg, and, and Shapiro from Cape Town, who was also a brilliant soci uh, social anthropologist. And uh, I think that taught me the importance of uh, a whole lot of social processes, which are obviously not evident in the landscape, no, you, no, no, uh, no. and the need to take a fairly holistic view of things. Well, that's an uh, interesting point. I, I would uh, hope that we can uh, come back to that uh, at the end of the conversation. Uh, now, you started in uh, agriculture and geography, but I have got to know you as an urban geographer. Well, it's uh, so how did this happen, and how did well, you end up in uh, Tasmania? Uh, I suppose that's uh, a strange uh, uh, set of sequences too. I, when I first went to South Africa, uh, I thought uh, the one thing I had something to contribute to in the discipline was in agricultural geography because I had been, I'd had a lot of training, postgraduate in agricultural economics, and most agricultural geography seemed to me to be incredibly superficial, remote from the real decision-making processes in agriculture. And so I thought I had something to contribute, but uh, uh, Professor Talbot, who was head of the department, gave all the lectures in agricultural geography and gave me no opportunity to move into that field. So I did research in the field, but I didn't teach, and that's not a very satisfactory procedure. And then gradually I got interested in the social problems of South Africa. You can't be immune to them if you oh. live there, mm -hmm. and uh, I had at Cape Town University, many students who were hybrid students, they were a mixture, so, you know, Cape Coloured, so called, uh, and I also had, of course, European, both African speaking and English speaking, uh, together with Indians and Bantu, and it was a very diversified um, student body. And I got so interested in the students uh, and uh, in their problems and so on that I, the first major piece of work I did in urban geography was around about 1950 when I constructed uh, uh, an ethnic map of Cape Town house by house. Uh, we in fact, I employed a great team of field observers, almost all of whom were Cape Coloureds, mainly postmen, uh, the whole of the post, almost the whole of the postal force of Cape Town and a lot of other, and a lot of school teachers, uh, European as well as uh, Cape Coloured, but there are many Cape Coloured because they had a much greater perception of, uh, of ethnic differences. And uh, we, we did it household by household for a city of two-thirds of a million, million people. And that work was subsequently published by the Royal Geographical Society. But that was my first entree into urban geography, and it really came about through a desire to understand uh, something which was a major problem of the country in which I was living. Mm -hmm. It didn't mm -hmm. come about because of training as an urban geographer. Uh, and subsequently, of course, I, and it, I suppose it did grow out of my earlier work in the social anthropology, uh, but after I got to Australia, I moved into economic work. You asked me about the transfer to Australia. Yes, yes. I, I don't know whether I should really give you the truth on that <laughs> one. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily give, lend any stature to myself geographically. Uh, 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 when my wife got restless about being in Cape Town, and she never was happy there, she was English, and uh, while she was excited to go to Africa, the reality of uh, tension, living in a society which is deeply divided and with acute tensions, uh, made her feel that she wanted to leave the country. We had two small children then, uh, and they were just starting the university at Salisbury in Rhodesia, and our professor of classics became the first vice-chancellor and tried to persuade me to go to Salisbury as a senior lecturer to begin the Department of Geography there. And I was strongly motivated to do this. Um, but in fact, my wife said was against it. And she happened to see in the London Times, which I got airmail, I was still very English at that stage, I suppose, uh, that there was a job going in Hobart in Australia to start a geography department, a senior lecturer, very similar to one in Salisbury. And she asked me if I would apply, and I said, well, I thought that Australia was the edge of the earth, and if you went as far as Tasmania, you were in severe risk of dropping over the edge. Uh, so I, I wasn't interested, but she wrote for the particulars and uh, uh, persuaded me to apply, and um, I was offered the job on Christmas Eve, and by Boxing Day I'd weakened, I'm afraid. <laughs> it, that's, uh, it's not a good story. When I got there, I wasn't very happy with the university or with Tasmania, and I moved after a few years to the National University in Canberra. Uh, 
Uh, none of you had any acquaintance with uh, Australia no, in the not at all, no. before, so it was jump. It was a great jump in into what, in fact, turned out to be, I thought, an extremely de deep and murky pond. I didn't really like uh, the very closed society of Tasmania at that stage, and it was very isolated. Yeah. And uh, when was this more precisely? 1952. Uh -huh. And uh, in '55, we had a royal commission, a government inquiry into the university, which I helped to engineer, actually. I, I was so concerned about the place. And when nothing happened afterwards, Oscar Spate, who was the mm. head of the department in Canberra, invited me to join him in Canberra. I'd known him in London before. And I went to Canberra, but uh, as a result of my efforts, they decided to found a full department with a chair. And then after about six months they asked me whether I'd be interested in coming back to the chair and I I don't know if it was wise or unwise I went back and but you, are, you are the person who has been in, in charge of building up the geography department yes entirely in yes the whole since uh, 1952, 1952 yes. 52, I it's uh, I suppose by Australian standards it's now about a medium-sized geography yeah. department uh, although we're the second smallest university um, we have a staff of 13 academics and it's a very broadly based department uh, in that uh, I've deliberately made it um, half and half physical and human. Uh -huh. We have a very uh -huh. strong geomorphology uh -huh. stream uh -huh. Uh -huh. and it's part of my belief that geography is an integration of physical and human uh -huh. uh, or should that's, be. That's interesting to, to hear, particularly from somebody who has so, so strong ties to economics. Yes, well, I, I myself am very much a social scientist, but uh, uh, I do believe that, uh, particularly in an environment like Tasmania, which only has 400,000 people, 450,000 mm. people, is a very mountainous island, and it's got it's a superb laboratory for a great range of landform studies. Mm -hmm. uh, we have actually three geomorphologists mm -hmm. out of a team of 13, so we can really specialize in that area. Mm -hmm. And I think some first-class work, the best work in our department, currently is being done in that area, I think. I see. Now, uh, your first steps into urban geography would what we on the European continent would call social geography, yeah. I think. But later you... Uh, oh, moved, well, uh, further to you. There were threads uh, much earlier than that, I suppose, of a more systematic uh, urban systems approach to geography, because uh, when I was in London in 1947, I got to know Bob Dickinson very well, R.E. Uh -huh. Dickinson, yes. Yes. who was a reader then at yeah. University College yeah. London. And, and he uh, had already... Yes, that's back. right, yes. Yeah. And he uh, subsequently went to Syracuse in yeah. America. Yeah. But he was a geographer who could read German fluently. And my German was not very good. I could get along in a halting way. And I, was, I remember him telling me all about Kristala's book. Uh -huh. This was in 1947. And uh, I resolved that someday I must read Cristal and do something about it. And I went to Cape Town, and shortly afterwards, uh, Hans Carroll from uh -huh. Zurich yes. uh, came out and stayed with us, actually, at Cape Town, and then went and did some research in the Karoo and published uh, two substantial papers uh, in the uh, Swiss uh, Geographical uh, yes. uh, uh, And uh, he sent me copies of these, and uh, we spent a lot of time talking about central place theory. And I came to the International Geographical Congress in Stockholm in 1960, yes, yeah. and uh, uh, Hans uh, introduced me to Cristala then. Uh -huh. and, and, uh, uh, I unfortunately didn't come to Lourdes. No, it's the great uh, did, regret of did my I life. Did I not uh, invite you, or did you? Not no, you did time? not invite me. But I'm oh, not that sure was that a, a uh, I was a little bit short of money at that stage. I suppose <laughs> I had a family already of uh, three or four children. Uh, I have four daughters these days, and uh, uh -huh. uh, I am afraid I only came to st uh, uh, to. Uh, uh, Stockholm, but I had a long discussion with Kristala and Hans Carroll, mm -hmm. which in fact uh, helped me. And also, I had dinner one evening with Brian Berry and Bill Garrison, and, oh, uh, yeah. oh. and I suppose those two factors had a lot of influence on me. I, I had, in fact, already by that stage in 1959-60 done the field work for a central place study of Tasmania. And I had personally visited every settlement in the island, of which there are about 430 or something, uh, 
and uh, done field work on every one of them and used secondary sources like uh, directories and so on as, uh, as merely a check on the original data. Uh, and I'd also combined this with a detailed study of farming systems in the island uh, where I was linking farming systems to uh, central places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, out of this I published some papers, and I suppose there must have been some of the earliest in the English language. Uh, I mean, there was some of Brian Berry's work uh, antedated mine, but I'd done my field work before I met Brian Berry or knew mm -hmm. of his work, mm -hmm. and mine developed quite separately. So out of that I got very much involved into analysis of urban patterns, uh, both uh, intra-metropolitan, I did a lot of work on central business mm. districts and out of that eventually got interested in retailing and wrote a book on retailing. Uh, but I was still very much interested in urban systems. And I suppose from about uh, 1965 to 1975 my major preoccupation was with public policy in relation to urban systems. Uh, related just to Tasmania or to, no, to, to Australia. Australia as a whole? Uh, it so happened that in 1965 the Social Science Research Council, of which I was a member, uh, was approached by the Australian Planning Institute to set up uh, uh, an institute which specialised in operational research on urban problems. Mm -hmm. And I was one of three appointed to a committee by the Social Science Research Council. Who were the other ones? Noitz? Uh, no, Neutzer was not involved. Uh, he was uh, a young lecturer then in uh -huh. Canberra. I knew I Neutzer well. Uh, no, I'm afraid it was a, it was an interdisciplinary thing. I you see, see. there was an, an economist, uh, uh, Alex Hunter, who now is dead, oh. unfortunately, uh, who was involved, and there was, uh, uh, I think, uh, a political scientist, and then two planners from the Planning Institute. And for three years, we schemed and organised to get this institute and we raised funds from each of the six state governments in Australia as well as the federal government. Uh, the federal government said that they would contribute and every state government would contribute thinking that somebody would say no and of course we managed to persuade them all. It was a marvellous uh, experience in how to use leaders of society to get what you want. We were, we were <laughs> frankly elitist and went through the top yes. echelon in Australia and it gave me enormous contacts. We also, when we set up the institute, uh, we resolved that there would be no more than 15% academics. 15? 15 only on only the council. 15. We now have about 30. All the rest would be practitioners, either uh -huh. heads of companies or, uh, yes, or yes. government servants or leading planners, people who are actively involved in the urban yes. scene, uh, so that the thing would clearly be operational in the way mm -hmm. in which it functioned, and we wouldn't do academic research for the sake of academic advancement of individuals. And uh, in the early 70s, I was chairman of the Board of Management. We had a council of about 130, uh, together with a Board of Management of about 25 or 26, and I was chairman of it. When the Whitlam government came in, the Labour government in 72, with, on a platform of reform of urban affairs in Australia, and I became an advisor to the Australian government and came over to Geneva three times as an Australian delegate to United Nations meetings on housing, building and planning. And until about 1975 I was very much preoccupied with practical matters and I distilled some of this into a book a few years ago on Australian mm -hmm. cities and public policy. But after about 1975 my involvement with government has declined somewhat. Mm -hmm. I'm still much involved in indicative planning for the housing industry in Australia. Uh, on a federal basis, and, uh, and well, what is your uh, attitude to this now? When you look back on it, did you do you, do you feel that you managed to achieve what this institute well, wanted to do, or how? That's an extremely difficult question. I think, as in all cases, you can only judge people's behaviour or achievements in terms of their own personality and. Uh, what they would like to do. I, I sometimes regret that I didn't do more academic work. I, I published fairly extensively and I never stopped publishing, uh, uh, but uh, I think I would have published so much more had I not been so involved. Uh, yeah, but I, but I think, uh, sorry, your question of the results, I would say that probably I, I'd be lucky if about 10% of my input produced results, but you have to be very humble and modest mm -hmm. if uh, if you're hoping going to achieve with leading bureaucrats some real input. Mm 
Mm -hmm. uh, and they must have thought it was useful because uh, two or three years ago I was honoured in the Queen's Birthday Honours List for what they called exceptional services to urban planning. So <laughs> it must have <laughs> had some too. impact. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, and uh, the institute is, is still... Oh, it's still uh, flourishing. Uh, I'm, still on, on the I'm still on the board, but yeah. uh, I am thinking of retiring from the board because I've got so many other involvements and it's uh -huh. now... Uh, an enormous organisation across Australia with state divisions and so on. Uh, so it's very satisfying that one's uh -huh. been And this uh, explains the great number of flights over from Tasmania. Oh, yes, to yes. I, uh, to come over to Europe on last Friday was my 669th crossing of Bass Strait by Air, yes. Yes, yes it, uh, mainly my travel's been to Canberra, but in 1968 I was invited to Canberra to the National University to... Uh, 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 to by the end, electoral committee for the chair of geography, when Spate became director, yeah. and uh, uh, I was given to understand that the chair uh, was being seriously considered as my chair from now onwards if I wanted it. But uh, uh, I, I remember the real decision not to go to Canberra came out when they started to tell me that I was. Uh, much better off in Canberra, it was so much more central and so on, and I said that that I thought that Canberra was almost as isolated as Hobart, <laughs> not quite, it was only a very small margin, mm. and in fact everywhere is isolated really, because the people who matter to me, I can count on the fingers of two hands, and unfortunately they're in almost as many countries. Mm. So when I got back to Hobart, I wrote them a very nice letter and said I greatly appreciated the invitation, but uh, decided to stay in Hobart. And that was being true to myself, because Tasmania, I think, is one of the loveliest landscapes I know anywhere in the world. And to me, that's still terribly important. And so your childhood uh, uh, love yes. of, of landscapes I've gets never lost somehow it. satisfied in a particular yeah, way. I've never happened. lost that, and I've never lost fl uh, love of flying. And uh, ever since I turned on camera, I've made a point of going around the world at least well, once a year, and I've yes, now... Yes, I, I heard you tell me that yeah. before, yeah. I've done 22 overseas trips now, yes, sir, sir. largely at my own expense, but it's That's what sir. I've enjoyed doing. Yes, yes. But that means that this uh, issue of isolation is really not... It's not isolated. I also have the best library of any geographer I've ever met. I, I admittedly, admittedly, I haven't seen the libraries of most geographers, but I've got over 5,000 volumes, oh, and, uh, uh, and, right and I have something like uh, 18 journals with very long runs. So mm -hmm. I've got a very large working collection myself. And that's your private My collection? My private library, so what, yeah. uh, In addition to what... Again, uh, something I built up because I am... To many people, extremely isolated, and indeed I am in trying to get books. And I'm in the centre of the world, and Everybody everywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, but um, I understand that you have also uh, filled important position for your university. Yes. In, uh, well, that also came about by accident, I suppose, as probably most leading administrators, uh, uh, at least in universities, get into it by accident. Uh, uh, I've always been concerned about the social issues, both in the wider society and also in the small community in which I'm located. And uh, accordingly, I gradually got more and more involved. And in the late 60s, I was chairman of our professorial board for three years, during which the vice-chancellor was suddenly taken seriously ill, and I was made acting vice-chancellor for a while. And uh, since then, I've had two periods of pro-vice-chancellor as second uh, in the administrative mm -hmm. hierarchy, and I am currently now full-time pro-vice-chancellor, but I've always taken it on on certain conditions. I can go on doing research, I can go on travelling, and that I would only take it on for a limited period so that I have the right to go back to academic work, which I intend to do at the end of next year. Mm -hmm. I intend to spend... So uh, you have a, a stand-in, so to speak, in the department for the moment? Yes, yes, yeah. there's a, well, it, it's more than a stand-in, we have an elected head system, uh -huh. and so there is a head of the department, yeah, but the department. Uh, still who's a, a place, geomorphologist. There's still yeah. a place for you. Oh, yes, you yes, I can go back, yes. Well, uh, let's, before it's too late, take up some uh, points which I would like to, uh, to ask you about. First of all, this so-called quantitative period. Yes. You, you, as well as I, became somehow involved yes. in yes. But What is your attitude to the whole thing today? Well, I don't think my attitude has changed all that much because having uh, 
a fairly solid initial training in economics and having kept fairly close to economic literature, I, had, uh, I was fairly familiar with what quantitative procedures had done for the subject of economics and uh, accordingly I think my attitude has always been that it was a, a most welcome innovation, long delayed in geography, but after all it was part of a, of a total approach to, to geographical problems, a part of equipment that all geographers should have, but it should never be the purpose of geographical inquiry. And I think one of the advantages too of being in isolation is that one is forced to read the literature of Europe and North America in a sense and one also has time to reflect and one takes a more balanced view perhaps than those who are closer to the innovation and at the very centre of innovation might take. Uh, yes, I think that's been a very wholesome thing, and but fortunately, by and large, it's now in perspective in most places. Mm -hmm. And it uh, certainly uh, helped to raise the standard oh, yes, of uh, the students and teaching. Oh, we, we, our department espoused it very early on. We uh, very early did, we were the first department in Australia to get rid of uh, uh, regional geography per se. And for the last 15 mm -hmm. years, we haven't taught it, but we've taught rural systems and regional mm -hmm. systems and urban systems, and we have. Uh, uh, fairly solid quantitative courses right from the very beginning of the program right through so that uh, I think we've, we've we have a solid basis in this but it's never really got too much out of hand one or two of my colleagues of course have but uh, mm -hmm. by and large I don't think it has. No, I see. Uh, uh, you mentioned um, a couple of times that um, wholeness approach which is or should be maybe characteristic to geography appeal to you and what you have told me about your love of landscape and your combination of anthropology, morphology and economics sort of yeah. makes me believe that you really think uh, and practice also in this way. But uh, what do you think we, we could do about it? We have this very strong pressure on specialization and still uh, we try to believe that everybody after all must be something yes. of a generalist. I, uh, this is a, a, a very crucial problem and uh, while my philosophy is holistic, uh, my practice is not, uh, regrettably. Uh, I think that uh, the value of it is that, uh, that while one must specialize in specialization, one must continually explore uh, related fields that might have some bearing on it so that one doesn't uh, become myopic and therefore chase uh, variables or factors which uh, uh, at best a very partial explanation uh, and I found this when I was on a very small group advising the Australian government on new cities in Australia in the early 70s where we had a very distinguished economist and a distinguished sociologist and a political scientist and a, a captain of industry and so on on this small committee and I think the real value that I had if any in that context was that I could see the relevance and the, uh, the balance between the factors that were being put forward, whereas the economist could only push an economic line and the sociologist uh, that you must think of what people want and what their values are and their lifestyles and so on, and he had no other vision. Whereas I think the whole of my training as a geographer had persuaded me to take a much more balanced view, and I think that that's terribly important both in the real world and also in academia. But that's not to say that one shouldn't specialise. One must specialise. Mm -hmm. It's essential. But at the same time, one's got to have regard for many other processes which normally we just don't bother to, to probe. Mm -hmm. uh, we leave to others because mm -hmm. it's their field. We should talk to our colleagues more, uh, both within the discipline and also within other mm -hmm. social sciences or might be physical sciences, but certainly social sciences. And that's one of the advantages, of, in my case, of being in a fairly small university. I know all the economists and sociologists and political scientists well. And, uh, you have a campus where things are all together. We have a, a campus and, so and it's fairly compact. Yeah, so you are familiar with the problems I tried yes, to yes. show you yes, indeed, on our yes. little walk. Yes, yeah. that must be very difficult. Uh, yeah. I remember uh, Kiris Napluszynski is here at this uh, uh, meeting now and uh, in 1964 he and I were guests at, of honour at a luncheon that was put on at the London School of Economics by Waldridge and Stamp and uh, I remember saying to Waldridge uh, how marvellous it must be to be in London and have six departments of geography. The, the stimulus you must get from six 
communities of geographers all interacting and he said it's totally different they're all separate cells and there's practically no interaction mm. whatsoever and he was very scathing mm. and I think that's a, a problem of all large universities and it's something we must always be on mm. our guard against mm. that's more or less perhaps beautiful after all. well it's it's also ugly being small I think you've got to exploit the advantages or take advantage of the advantages of any particular place mm -hmm. and also be humble in relation to its limitations. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, you know very well I suppose that our colleagues in more specialized disciplines they accuse us for amateurism. Yes. But you seem to feel that there is, uh, there are ways of trying to balance views without having to be too much of a... Well, having pioneered a department of geography uh, I've been the subject of attack from all quarters and I think on the whole I can say that our department and myself are now in reasonably high standing in the, in the academic community, otherwise I wouldn't hold my present office oh. I suppose. Uh, but uh, I think the important thing is again to be able to hold one's own in a specialist field, which is another argument for specialization, yes. Yes. Uh, so that I can talk to the economists and language that they find acceptable, mm -hmm. and I think that's uh, that's very important. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but uh, there is then uh, a difficulty uh, concerning student training, because this more broad or general view, in addition to the specialities, takes time to, and well, you cannot uh, really in a few years. Of course, I don't know your university structure, but uh, one of the great weaknesses of the Australian uh, university system uh, is that it's founded on the Scottish system whereby they begin with four subjects at the university, four quite separate disciplines, mm. and in the second year they narrow to three, and the third year they narrow to two, and in the fourth year they narrow to one. So they've always got, hopefully, a cognate set of disciplines coming through, and they have some knowledge of that. Whereas I find British honours departments, uh, and have always thought this, are very stoutifying uh, and restricted in, in their understanding of related disciplines. Uh, because uh, they specialize in one discipline yes, from yes, the beginning. So you yes. would prefer your system with broad uh, uh, Yes, providing we recognize yes. that it has grave weaknesses and I that know. you really should go much longer to get the degree of expertise in one's own mm. discipline. Uh, but one's got a good basis for starting. The snag is, of course, in our system that because of this great desire for everyone doing what they want to do, they don't always start with the right combination of subjects. Uh -huh and that has difficulties, but uh, imperfections in every system. <laughs> well, if, you, uh, if we look upon our discipline as such, um, as, at least as I feel it, one big problem now is the contact with the physical geographers. Uh, but maybe yes. uh, in your case, it's uh, by, by us, so many of them uh, seem to move away towards uh, more well, physical uh, geosciences and it's very remote from human concerns. Well, uh, that's, uh, that's still a problem with us because even in my own department uh, we tend to be a bit split. Uh, but uh, we nevertheless have run common courses in uh, quantitative methods, for example, uh, where we use different uh, examples, uh, physical and human. Mm -hmm. uh, they haven't been all that successful. And we do run a series of weekly departmental seminars in which we try and get everybody to come, all the staff and postgraduate students, whether they're physical or human. Of course they don't, but uh, we try uh, to bridge this gap as much as we can, and we have a lot of general discussions to try and uh, bridge the gap. But I must confess that uh, it's still to some extent artificial. Uh, the links of the human geographers are obviously much closer with the humanities and the social sciences, and the physical uh, uh, geographers are obviously much closer to the natural mm. sciences, and mm -hmm. that's as it should be. Mm -hmm. um, well, there could, could be uh, maybe some sort of anthropocentric um, uh, variety of, uh, of uh, physical geography which is not really developed. Yes. Uh, but, uh, well, I think there may well be a return to that in the near future. As, uh, uh, it could, in certain mm -hmm. centres, I'm not going to say it's going to be a universal trend, but there are uh, this concern again with a more holistic approach and concern with processes. Uh, I think is going to take people back into some of those mm -hmm. areas, and certainly people working in the third world, as so many people are in Australia. Uh, I think there isn't quite the same dichotomy with many of them. No. Uh, there are very few departments uh, 
have the dual stream in Australia. I think Sydney is about the only other one that's preserved it as strongly as we have. Uh, all the others have gone very strongly towards uh, human geography. So uh, physical geography is partly disappearing in some departments? Oh, very largely in Australia. Just a few departments which still have some physical geographies. I mean, Monash, which I think is the best human geography department in Australia, has something like 23 staff, but only two of them are physical geographers. One's a climatologist and the other one's a geomorphologist. One of our own graduates, it happens. <laughs> 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 Now, one problem in, in uh, this country, uh, in my view, is that uh, biogeography has uh, disappeared out from geography. Yes, well, been taken over by the botanists. But again, one of the problems, I think, in biogeography uh, is to get someone who is botanically trained. Uh, in, uh, we, I tried for 20 years to get somebody on our staff mm -hmm. because Tasmania, again, has a tremendously richly mm -hmm. varied vegetation. And it uh, so happened that a geographer at Melbourne did a PhD in our botany department. And I managed to get a lectureship created at the end of this time, and he was appointed to it. And he's a wonderful acquisition. And similarly, our uh, climatologist is, in fact, a Canadian physicist who did his bachelor and master's degree at McMaster in physics, and then became a meteorologist, and then did a uh, a PhD in uh, microclimatology at uh, Vancouver, and we were very lucky to get him. So I think each of the people that I've selected for our staff I've, uh, it has a, an expertise in a related field. And, and while it poses difficulties in producing cohesion in the department and instability in the minds of the young uh, members of staff sometimes, nevertheless it makes for a very vigorous and productive mm -hmm community of scholars, I and mean, when there's very few of you, have to be reasonably productive. Well, all scholars should, of yeah, course. <laughs> now you have, the, in recent years, uh, become involved in the International Geographical yes. Union. What uh, do you hope for this union to achieve? I think there's great scope in the uh, International Geographical Union uh, for uh, international collaboration in a wide variety of fields. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, the structure and administration of the IGU, as you well know, probably very much better than I do, I'm sure very much better than I do, uh, has tended to become somewhat ossified and attempts at reform and change have not been very successful. But it's also been a fairly autocratic system, uh, I think, on the whole. And I would like to see very much more welling up of uh, ideas and activity uh, which can be harnessed within the mm. framework of the ITU. And I think if that can happen, then it's almost certainly likely to become more successful in raising funds and so on. I think it's got a great deal of potential, uh, but uh, uh, the form it's going to take is, is you know, another question. I think the traditional pattern of congresses and so on has become rather stoutified and, mm. uh, and not all that productive, whereas the Lund Symposium in 1960 was the first of a new era, a very successful mm. symposia. But I think there's still scope for other smaller regional con congresses, mm. and, uh, not only regional in terms of the membership, but more particularly as localized in terms of the fields that they focus on. Mm -hmm. uh, so that you can bring a wide community mm -hmm. of scholars together, but focus on a fairly restricted theme. Mm -hmm. And this uh, uh, procedure of that kind could be very helpful for the developing countries, maybe. Yes, yes, I think Because the problems vary so much. I think the lack of involvement of the developing countries and the real activity of the IGU is one of the greatest problems we have to face. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. But you have now so much experience from Africa, for example, so you could, I suppose, yes, well, uh, I have help in this something, but, uh, direction. Uh, yeah. Now, let me ask you, finally, a personal question. You started with uh, music and uh, literature and so on. Have you been able to pursue this interest? Yes, I, I love music. I, I, it's my greatest relaxation. Do you play? Uh, well, I used to play the violin, but my wife is an extremely talented violinist. So, in my wisdom, many, many years ago, I gave it away. Yeah. You can't have competing <laughs> domestic noises. And uh, 
I have four daughters, all of whom play instruments. I have a clarinetist in the family and uh, uh, someone who plays the flute and another one who's completing a music degree at the moment with piano as the main instrument. Uh, I live in a household of music. I have a large collection of long playing records and to me there's nothing lovelier than to, uh, to, to lie in bed looking out over the Derwent estuary which is a magnificent view uh, and listening to first-class music is just heavenly. It's my idea of peace. And every morning, my wife, who gets up early and likes to bustle around, uh, I get up at 6.30 and get a little bit of breakfast, and I go back and I sit in bed eating my breakfast and looking at the view and listening to music. And I think that's the, uh, uh, you know, to me, that's the, the finest thing I know in life, and it's the beginning of every day when I'm at home. <laughs> it's landscape and music. It's landscape and music, and, and you say literature. Yes, I've got three novels with me now, which I read in planes and so on. One of them is a, 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 an Australian novel about the outback of northern Australia, uh, Kunadu. It's uh, about an Aboriginal family and this contact with the white uh, station people. And I'm going back uh, via Darwin to Australia. I have a daughter who's teaching Aboriginal children yeah, right in yeah. the outback. She's, uh, her nearest white neighbour is 200 kilometres oh, away okay. and I'm visiting her on my way back to Hobart. So there will be a lot of contrast in this short trip. Yeah. Well, I think this is a good point to conclude now and I hope, Peter, that next time you uh, tour the world you will remember that you learned this also. Well, thank you very much, Torsten. Stopping yes. in. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, how are you? How do you? What do I'm you? Sorry, it's a very rambling sort of discourse. <laughs> no, no, 